Hey everyone, it's Chris Hornung and welcome to the Antique Football Man Cave. In 2011, a Fox News report cited a Cleveland Clinic study that claimed that old leather football helmets offered similar and in some cases better protection against head injuries than modern helmets. Coming on the heels of research linking concussions to traumatic brain injuries like CTE, the results of this study beg the question, are helmet manufacturers doing enough to protect football players? Or has the game become too violent for the human body? There are an estimated 1.1 million high school football players in the United States today. During the course of a regular football season, one in six will sustain a concussion. For every diagnosed concussion, most players suffer multiple suspected concussions and dozens of bell ringers or subconcussive impacts which new research suggests may be a more significant cause of long-term neurological impairment. The brain is surrounded by cerebral spinal fluid, which acts as a shock absorber in minor impacts. More significant impacts can cause the brain to collide with the inside of the skull, resulting in a traumatic brain injury or concussion. Recent advances in medical technology have improved the identification of concussions. However, it has been estimated that less than 5% of concussions sustained in football are reported. So how do we compare today's concussion rates with those of the leather football helmet era? Simple answer is, we can't. Football injury statistics have been collected since the late 1800s, and the results show a dramatic reduction in player fatalities due to head and spine injuries since their peak in the late 1960s and early 1970s. But concussions weren't regularly reported until the 1970s, and even then, it was often only when a player lost consciousness, which occurs in only about 10% of sustained concussions. Due in part to football's warrior culture and the fear of letting one's teammates down, Many concussed players refuse medical attention and return to the game. Not only did this risk greater neurological damage, it also eliminated a report of a player not being able to play because of their injury. So without any historical data on injuries, we're really left with only one option to determine the effectiveness of leather helmets compared to their modern counterparts, and that is to run the two through a modern helmet testing protocol. For help with our analysis, we traveled halfway across the country to Salem, Illinois. Salem is home to approximately 8,000 residents and one of the largest manufacturers of football helmets in the world, Shutt Sports. Founded in 1918 by Bill Shutt, a basketball hoop manufacturer, Shutt currently produces 40% of the helmets worn in the NFL and five of the top six rated football helmets available today. We scheduled a visit with Robert Erb, Schutz CEO, and Glenn Beckman, the company's Director of Marketing and Communications, and got permission to run our 1930s Goldsmith leather helmet through their testing facility. Chris, your, your sweet spot is the old helmets, the leather helmets, and we're going to see how they stack up today against the helmets that we make today for today's players. Everyone kind of knows that players are bigger, stronger, faster, and would they be as protected in the leather helmets as they are in today's helmets? Um, so the rig behind us is what's called the Noxy Drop Test. All football helmets today, for the past 40 years or so, all football helmets today have to pass the Noxy Test. And what we do is we put a helmet on this crash test dummy head, and we raise it to a height and we drop it, and we measure how much force makes it through the helmet, through the padding, and to the brain, to the brain itself. Noxy, which stands for National Operating Committee on Standards for Athletic Equipment, was founded in 1969 to commission research on reducing injuries in organized athletics. Noxie's football helmet test standard requires drops at four different velocities and six different helmet positions. A helmet's effectiveness in attenuating the force of impact to the brain is measured by an accelerometer located within the head form. A data analyzer measures the g-force of each impact and reports a severity index score. This data is then calibrated to field data and the helmet is rated using the Virginia Tech STAR rating system. For our analysis, we ran each helmet through the Noxie Front Impact Attenuation Test, starting with the Shut Vengeance. The Vengeance Pro weighs in at 2.85 pounds and retails between $250 and $450, depending on specific features. The Vengeance Noxie Severity Index scores are some of the lowest ever recorded earning the helmet a five-star rating from Virginia Tech. The Goldsmith number 43 weighed in at 1.6 pounds and retailed for $5 when new in 1930. 
The leather helmet severity index scores for the first two drops were so high that we had to abandon dropping from higher elevations out of fear of destroying the head form and accelerometer. Based on the results we were able to record, the Goldsmith number 43 would receive a rating of zero stars. The leather helmet exceeded the maximum allowable Noxie severity index score for the first drop and exceeded the maximum allowable score for any drop in just the second test of the day. In fact, compared to dropping an unprotected head form, the leather helmet was only able to reduce the force of a blow by approximately 23%. The modern helmet, in comparison, attenuated the force by 72%. In other words, the shut vengeance was over 300% more effective in reducing concussive forces than the vintage leather helmet. The modern helmet's superiority is basic physics. The force on the brain in a collision is equal to the brain's mass multiplied by its acceleration, which in this case is the rate at which it comes to rest. If the mass and velocity at the point of collision are constant, the only way to reduce the force on the brain is to increase the amount of time that the brain is in motion. Modern helmets accomplish this by employing advanced impact absorbing cushioning. The Vengeance features Shutt's patented TPU impact absorption padding on the interior of the helmet. Meanwhile, the Goldsmith number 43 relies on 3 8 inch cotton batting and an elastic harness, which would provide very little impact absorption in a collision. The results of our testing couldn't be more clear. While no helmet can eliminate the risk of concussions or head and neck injuries, the modern helmet was over 300% more efficient at reducing the force of impact than its leather counterpart. A player wearing the leather helmet in today's game would have a much higher risk of incurring a concussion while playing. Unfortunately, other evolutionary factors have negated many of the advances in equipment protection. In 1930, the average NFL lineman was six feet tall and weighed 225 pounds. Today, he's six foot five, 310 pounds, and at the same time, considerably faster. The game itself has changed as well. What began as a rugby-style scrum, where most of the action occurred at the line of scrimmage, now features spread offenses, which increase the likelihood of high-speed collisions. Finally, as new helmets and padding have been introduced over the past century, players have developed a false sense of security and invincibility. With a well-padded helmet, players are more apt to lead with their head or ignore the basic instinct to protect it in a collision. For many, the game of football has simply grown too violent. According to recent surveys, over 50% of American parents don't want their children playing football. To counter this growing sentiment, the NFL and the NCAA have instituted new rules, new concussion guidelines, and funded new research on diagnosing concussions. Will it be enough? Those who love the game certainly hope so. The leagues must protect their players if they have any hope of protecting America's favorite pastime. Until next time, I'm Chris Hornung with AntiqueFootball.com.